Zani, who is with National Review, and he's the author of a brand new book, Euro Trash. Good morning, David. How are you? I am well. Thanks for having me. You know, this is the first of six segments I'm actually going to do with you, and it's because I found Euro Trash so upsetting. And I told the Christian Employers Alliance on on uh, Monday night when I spoke to them that I just finished reading David Harsani's book and I'm completely depressed over the state of religious belief in Europe. I knew it was bad, David. I didn't know it was this bad. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, there are nations in Europe where there is basically no religion anymore, no Christianity for sure, Eastern Europe as well as Western Europe, and the trend is not, uh, is not slowing down. And unfortunately, you can see some of that happening here already. Uh, you can also see a lot of other reasons to compare Europe with the United States and say, I want the U.S. David, what was the motivation behind Eurotrash? It's a combative title, but I thought it was more an air of sad resignation to the fate of Europe than it is uh, polemic against it. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, most of our best ideas come from Europe and come from Christian culture. And I'm not Christian myself. But that's just a fact And my parent, my own parents escaped from Europe to come here. Um, but I noticed increasing, listen, there's always been, the elites have always been, uh, have always loved Europe, uh, thought that Europeans were more sophisticated than we are, and et cetera. But I've seen a real uptick in that sort of talk, and in, in not just in broad ways, but in specific policy sense. You know, the Paul Krugmans of the world, et cetera, they're always looking to Europe. So I thought it needed a debunking, at least. I think most of the, you know, we have the ideas we need here to make you, they should be looking here, not the other way around. And that, that was the impetus of the book. Uh, David, when you talk about Europhiles, uh, they're not named specifically. I kind of know who they are. I think our media actually leads the way because they're influenced by Le Mans and by the Times of London. And it's uh, it washes ashore in the United States in newsroom and it filters down to politicians. But who is like the leading Europhile? Who do you think of when you say Europhile? I think of Paul Krugman quite often. He's the straw man for me. On, on that issue. But I mean, you see it in, you know, with, with Bernie Sanders, with the progressive movement, you see it among politicians talking about Denmark, um, you know, in the Democratic Party. Frankly, you see a little bit of it now uh, on the on the right, uh, you know, nationalistic right, when people talk about Hungary, which they, I think, overrate tremendously. Um, so but but mostly, I think, of sort of the the Western European nations that people like Paul Krugman are always talking about. No one says, hey, we need to be more like Bulgaria. They say, yeah, yeah. we need to be more like Germany or France. You know, the dispositive fact in a very well-researched and well-documented book is on page 209 about comparing Europe to the United States. Women in the U.S., I'm quoting, have higher fertility rates than women in most European nations. That's the future. Now, serious demographic Collapse is hard to re reverse, you write, David Harsani, in Euro Trash. But the number one thing is, if you're not reproducing at 2.1, your society is dying. And, and Western Europe is dying. Yeah, I mean, when I say that it's a dying continent, I, I mean it. I, you know, Germany, I believe, is still the second oldest country or industrialized country after uh, Japan. Uh, people, every country is dying. I mean, there, this is why... In Eastern Europe, there has been a, you know, a state-driven, uh, you know, policies and tax cuts and benefits and all these to, to, to try to incentivize people to have kids. Same thing in Denmark and other places, but it's not really working. Unfortunately, since I wrote the book, we've seen, because of the census and other studies, that the American trajectory is much the same, and that is quite concerning. Now, uh, in the book, it, it suggests that we're better off and that particularly women hitting the age of 40 are becoming increasingly inclined to have children. Has that reversed in recent data that that's not in Euro trash? I'm not sure about after 40 children, but just in general, we're having fewer children. We're now on, you know, we're almost at European level. So um, that that is uh, that reflects poorly on a society in a number of ways, as I note in the book yeah oh it's not sustainable i mean it's the it's the number one takeaway from euro trash is that europe whatever you think of it it's not sustainable because they've run out of people and I, it's not just the scandinavian and nordic countries it's not just paris it's germany it's pretty much all the catholic countries too oh um, more yeah italy and, and and spain these countries are the worst usually and and you know they try to make up for immigration and of course i'm i'm pro immigration in general but the way that they their immigration policies their lack of assimilation uh the the, the ghettos of of islamic people there in france and germany and elsewhere that is that is no way 
to make up for for the problems of birth rates, and it, that has a you know there's a complete different set of problems with that 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 is hurting Western. We're going to come back and talk about that after the break. Last question before the first break, David Harsani. In Euro Trash, you you write about how even as COVID swept the continent, the European Union was busy laying down economic regulation. Do you think they're just uh, uh, playing the fool here? They're just so busy regulating because they know that they've got an existential crisis of survival on their hands? I think so. I mean, you know, they're technocrats. That's their religion. That's their faith. And they believe that, you know, the government holds solutions to all things. So that's why they're always busy with with, with government regulation. That's their only tool. Even facing the end times, when we come back, David, you're going to join me on Skype. We're going to continue the conversation. Eurotrash, available in bookstores now. Uh, Generalissimo will pick you up and switch you over to Skype, David. Thank you so much. Let me remind everyone, I'll be right back with David. You've got to go get Eurotrash. It's really a terrific book, but you also have to get this, relieffactor.com. Terrific sponsor of the show. I took it in the first hour. I remind you about it in hours two and three. I'll be out. Uh, as soon as I'm done talking to David and I'm going to do a Dr. Arn conversation after that's done, mid-morning, I'm out and about on the highways and byways of the Beltway. Because relieffactor.com makes it possible for me to do so. It makes it possible for you to do so as well by helping combat the, uh, the minor aches and pains that come with aging and exercise in the United States. You're definitely going to get older today. Uh, you probably ought to also be exercising. When we come back, I'm going to continue to talk not only about relieffactor.com, 1995, go get a three-week starter pack, but about David Harsani's book, Euro Trash, very provocative, very depressing. Stay tuned, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt inside the Beltway. This is part two of my six-part interview with David Harsani. David is with National Review, and if you haven't read his work, then you haven't been paying attention. I used to call him the voice of reason in the Rockies when I was the voice of reason in the West, because I always read your stuff in the Colorado papers, David. I didn't even know you had headed east. When did that happen? <laughs> Ten years ago, I think. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just, I'm just so used to reading David in, in the Colorado papers that he shows up at NRO, and I'm surprised. David, I want to go to the heart of Eurotrash, which is, I think, on page 217 and page 238. Without faith, on page 217, you write, European culture increasingly relies on self-serving scientific paganism. On the last page, page 238, you write, there is no anti-clericalism to check the rise of vapid universalism endorsed by European elites or the illiberal orthodoxy of political Islam. Universalism is a faith that has overtaken Europe at a rate faster than any other religious movement in history. Universalism might be malleable and often incoherent, but it's an assault on family and life. It creates apathy and strips away identity. That's the core problem. Why did that happen? Was it the shock of two world wars, David? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know, because after after the uh, Iron Curtain fell, there was actually an uptick in religious observance among Europeans, especially in Eastern Europe. Um, which quickly turned around. So I, I don't know what the reasons are. I think as wealthier we get, probably the less religious we are. You see that happening in the United States as well. Um, it, it poses so many problems. Everything I wrote about always came back to faith in a way, because you have um, not just the, the moral structure you need to have a decent society, but you also, when you're religious, believe in things that are bigger than yourself. And that is what, why Americans and how Americans believe in the Constitution. And that's why religious people are far more uh, patriotic, frankly, about the Constitution, because they, they don't believe those rights were given to them by the state, but rather by something larger. And in Europe, I don't think that people believe that. They used to turn to monarchies, and then they turned to fascism and communism. There's always something they're trying to fill that hole with, in the, at least in the last hundred or more years, and it doesn't seem to work. And now they're just turning towards the European Union and bureaucrats uh, to, to sort of guide them as their, as their new priests. It does not work, obviously, because it's not working for Europe. What are the reasons I am always curious about why Europe went this way, but why America admires it? You know, how come we got this disease when it's clearly not working? And I think the answer is in, in what I call the, the, the semester abroad disease. It's like mad cow disease. If you spend a semester abroad when you're 21, you have a wonderful time. You eat well, you have a party for six months, and then you come home and you extrapolate from that that everything must be like being a student in Europe for six months when there's nothing at all to do with an American uh, having fun in Europe for six months. Have you thought that through, David? This all started to rise in the United States when we started to ship our college students away for a semester in Florence. And then they come back and they think, wow, Europe is great. 
Yeah. That as well. Yeah, I had thought about that, but also just tourism, right? I mean, when we go to Europe, it's beautiful. When people go to Hungary, they sit by the river, the Danube, and you know, sip coffee. But in the real world, f uh, about a mile out of the city, things aren't that way. The American home, I think, on I might be wrong about this, but it's close. Uh, uh, it's about a thousand square feet bigger than the average European home. We <laughs> we live in in mansions in our suburbs that that Europeans, most Europeans, could would not be able to comprehend. Um, so I, I think that our view of Europe is certainly skewed by our visits there, our short, week-long visits there. I agree. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about NICE. Have you ever read C.S. Lewis, That Hideous Strength? No. There is, at the heart of that book, the NICE establishment, which is the, the location of evil in the world. So when you bring up on page 40, there actually is a NICE at the NHS, the National Health Service, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. I was shocked. How could they possibly be so, so tone deaf not to know that one of C.S. Lewis's greatest novels involves a villainous agency called NICE? And uh, obviously it's because they're not Christian. You're not Christian. You haven't read the C.S. Lewis novel. I would recommend it to you highly. Uh, they teach it at Hillsdale on a par with 1984 and Brave New World, and I do think it is a, a model for our time. But you're right. Whenever there are acronyms, you also have authoritarianism. Yeah, it's, it's it, Brit Britain's system is is we have to. We, I should preface all this by saying that European healthcare systems are all a bit different. It's there, there's not a European Union system. So in 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 Britain, obviously they have a almost completely socialized system, which uh, which means that a lot of people are waiting for for care. Which means that a lot of people are denied care. Which means that uh, I think it's a nefarious and and uh, ineffective system. However. The British seem to love it. I mean, they celebrate it as if it were a church, in fact. So it is always kind of perplexing to me why they do that. And obviously, they're, they're pretty tone deaf, but so was I not to know that. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, it, the, best way to, the best way to judge that is to say, listen, where do people go when they really need care? Well, there's medical tourism in the United States. People, rich people from Britain don't go to France or Germany. They come to the United States for care. And that's the reason, that's the best example I have of why we're, we're better. When we come back, I'm going to continue to talk with David Harsani in the after show. And then he's coming back next week. I can't get through this book in one day's radio broadcasting, but you can get through it and you'll be enlivened by Eurotrash. Go and get it. Order it from Amazon.com. I will post the pod later today, the interview with David Harsani. I'm joined now by David Harsani. Part three of the, uh, the interview with Hugh Hewitt. The first two were on the radio today. Part three is off the radio and then he'll come back next week. David, you reference in your in your credits that you want to thank your parents for defecting. Would you give people just a quick rundown? I think that's a wonderful line. May every parent defect who can. Where did they defect from and what were their circumstances? Uh, they defected in 1968 from communist Hungary, um, left their families behind and everything they knew, and they came to the United States to, to ensure, I think, that their kids will, would, would have a better life. Now, uh, I should say that, you know, it's not as if they were persecuted in some you know terrible way in Hungary at the time, but uh, still they they understood that here at least they viewed this country as many people do come here as a meritocracy where they could achieve more, and uh, and that's what they did. And uh, I just I'm happy that I grew up here and not in 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 Budapest or some small town in Hungary. Now, David, you are very clearly pro-life. Uh, your discussion of euthanasia may be one of the most persuasive reviews of the Groningen Protocol in its aftermath that I cover occasionally on this show. Nobody believes me. You finally collected in one place all the statistics on the fact that European doctors are killing people at an alarming rate that's rising. And you're, you're very into birth rates, etc. But you are yourself uh, an atheist. So why do you even care? <laughs> I wish I wasn't. That's the thing. I, uh, you know, but you can't fake belief, right? Uh, but underneath all that, I, I mean, I just am a big fan of the moral structures of religion. I think that the, the message is good. I think that the, the, the communities it creates, America doesn't exist uh, without certain types of religions and certain types of um, evolution of religion. And I'm a fan of all of that. I think that it, 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 uh, you, we don't exist without that kind of faith. Um, so I pretend I think, you know, it's if you don't believe in God, you should pretend to believe in God because it helps you understand America and believe in the Constitution. 
And uh, I don't know, I mean, those are just the basic reasons, but I just think also that all our greatest ideas come from Christianity. Uh, I'm, I'm born Jewish, I, you know, I think that's part of it, but really it's a Christian culture. You know, the, the, the idea of free choice, for instance, of not, uh, you know, is, is a Christian idea at its core, and I just, I, you know, I'm a big fan well, of Well, you put ideas. your finger, you put your finger on the fact that constitutionalism is predicated on religious belief. You can't actually be a constitutionalist unless you believe there's a private domain and the Catholic Church subsidiarity. All of your ideas are Catholic. You ought to be a Catholic, David. I'm just telling you right now. If you spend enough time, you'll become a Catholic. Uh, with with uh, Mo Molly, uh, 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 says I should be a Lutheran, so I don't know. We'll see. But you know what's interesting? Oh, Molly, Molly's wrong about that. Molly <laughs> just doesn't want to go to church every Sunday. That's the pro that's the difference between Lutherans and Catholics. Let me ask you about your opening salvo, and then we'll save the rest for later. The opening salvo, a growing number of American elites, politicians, academics, pundits, journalists, among others, argue with increasing popularity that we should look across the Atlantic for solutions to our most pressing problems. That's page one. You describe their sneering and condescending approach to different things. We've talked about why that comes in. But in the face of all of this, the data that you've compiled, how does a Krugman hang on to it? Because there is no data arguing for the objective superiority of the European model. Well, it depends how you look at it, I guess. You know, we believe in freedom and we believe in the messiness of American capitalism. And we believe that this makes life for the most people, you know, the, the, the best. It's the most moral system. But I think he doesn't believe that. And people like him believe that a tech a technocratic state that uh, can can compel you to act in certain ways for reasons like climate change or, or whatever is going on or, or making sure that the every poor person has the same health care as every rich person or that people don't get too you know that there's more equality in in in, in wealth those things are more important to them so their their um, their hierarchy of, 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 of concerns are different than ours so that's basically their argument I think but do they even are, we are richer we are freer we are happier, and we used to produce more babies than anyone in Western Europe. Now, Great Britain has now left the European Union, and that's a good thing based upon Eurotrash. But in the face of all that data, to what do you attribute? I, I, I can't believe it's objective. These are economists. These are media people. They should be dealing in data. What is it really at the bottom of their attraction to Europe? I, I have my theory, but what do you think it is? Well, what is your theory? That there is no standard for right and wrong in Europe, and that most of American elites do not want a standard on which to be judged. Oh, that's interesting. That's probably part of it, I think. And I just think, I just think that they're fan first of all, I think they're fans of, of, of social. Now, they lie about the socialism of Europe in, in, for instance, Scandinavia, where they have very robust capitalistic systems sort of propping up giant welfare states. They want the welfare state. Bernie Sanders, for instance, but he doesn't want to tax everyone like they do in Scandinavia. So that's a different story. I, I think they're just fans. I mean, the Bernie Sanderses of the world are socialists, and they are fans of socialistic systems, and they're fans of big government. And Krugman is a fan of giant bureaucracies, uh, uh, you know, dictating how we live our lives. I, I don't know that it's more complicated, though I do like your theory as well. Well, I, I want to close by letting people know. Uh, one of the things David does in Eurotrash is outline some of the taxing policies of the so-called Nordic Wonderland. It's 57 to 60 percent actual tax rate. That doesn't include the VAT tax. My goodness, I, th I left California when it got to be uh, about half of my paycheck going to state, local and federal taxes. Not, But we don't have a VAT tax. In, in Europe, I, you, I guess you can't get away from it. You're going to get whacked at between 60 and 75 percent above 68,000 a year. Is that the number? Something like that. Yeah, I forget the exact number, but it's definitely something like that. And there are, of course, many other taxes people pay. They've created a dependency state in the sense that even the middle class and rich person is dependent on government for his health care, for his schooling, all that, all those things. And I think that, obviously, if there are people who suffer and poor people, and there always are, we need to try to help them through the state. I have no problem with that. However, once we create, we, we start, the mission creep comes in and we start creating this bureaucracy for everyone, um, it elbows out churches, it elbows out charity, it elbows out uh, the communal life that we have in the United States. And I think, you know, in, in, in smaller communities. So I think that uh, that's what they like. They want to centralize Washington in the same way European Union is centralized. And they, um, yeah, so that's what they like and that's what they feel better about. But that's obviously destructive.
When we come back next week, we're going to talk about the specific policies and the specific comparisons that David has made. In the meantime, go get Euro Trash from Amazon.com or a bookstore somewhere. Maybe David will read that hideous strength between now and next week. I hope so. But David, congratulations. Is the book taking off well? Yeah, it's doing fine. Thank you. And thanks for your help. You know, I have to say, you're oh, I mean, one of the few people who's, who's clearly read every page of the book, who's interviewed me. Oh, I couldn't. You know, the only thing I found that 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 gave me a start is that you quote Ezra Klein a lot. And Ezra's a friend of mine. I've known Ezra since he was in my daughter's fourth grade play as the surfing Santa. I've never believed that Vox was a reliable source of anything. <laughs> but you quote Ezra a lot because they do provide a lot of this Europhilistic uh, attra- a- a- attachment to the to the Western European experiment and a lot of, and they get a lot of hits and a lot of eyeballs, you know, so it's, it's important to debunk them. I think. I, I agree with you. I look forward to talking more about it because it is a fine, fine book. Thank you, my friend. I'll talk with David Harsani more next week. That's the interview for today with Hugh Hewitt. I'll talk to you on the next one on the interview with Hugh Hewitt.